slums will soon be only a memory. We will turn our prisons into factories, our jails into storehouses and corn cribs. Men will walk upright now, women will smile, and the children will laugh. Hell will forever be for rent. July 16th. 1920, the great evangelist Billy Sunday proclaimed this vision of the future under prohibition at a revival in Norfolk, Virginia, before a crowd of 10,000 people. The passage and ratification of the 18th Amendment was not the panacea for the nation's ills that the Reverend Sunday and his fellow prohibitionists hoped it would be. Speakeasies replaced saloons and organized crime stepped in to serve alcohol to the population. By 1926, the Treasury Department was meeting an unprecedented demand for currency used for large transactions by bootleggers, $10,000 bills. We are going to share the stories and words of three prohibitionists. Carrie Nation, the hatchet-carrying member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Billy Sunday, famed evangelist and a cheerleader for the Anti-Saloon League, and William E. Johnson, better known as Pussyfoot, a member of the Prohibition Party and later international champion of the Anti-Saloon League. The king of the bootleggers, George Remus, will be introduced to you. Pauline Sabin, who began as a supporter of Prohibition and became one of its most vocal critics when she saw the chaos that George Remus and other criminals like him had reigned on the country, will be giving voice to her thoughts. The Puritans set sail to Massachusetts with 14 tons of water, 10,000 gallons of wine, and 42 tons of beer. Alcohol consumption was part of the fabric of our country from the very beginning. In the introduction to the book, Drunks in American History, author Christopher Finnan shares a story that shows that alcoholism has no social or economic boundaries. President John Adams and his wife Abigail were concerned about their teenage son Charles, his friends and his drinking habits and his escapades while under the influence. The father wrote his son many admonishing letters. In 1799, John Adams learned the worst when he visited his daughter's home and there found Charles's wife and two children living. Charles had disappeared. The father wrote Abigail that their son was a madman possessed of the devil, and he renounced him. Abigail continued to communicate with Charles, though she too was angry. In November 1800, she saw her son for the last time. His body was bloated. He was in great pain and often incoherent. He died a few weeks later at the age of 30. He was not buried in the family tomb. His brother Thomas said, let silence reign forever over his tomb. By 1830, the annual consumption of alcohol in the United States was seven gallons per person, nearly three times what we drink today. Let me introduce myself. I am Carrie Nation. As a woman, I felt powerless under the control of first parents and then an alcoholic husband, and finally a husband who relied on me for financial support at times, and then took away from me the tools to have independence and support the family and causes I loved. Alcohol certainly destroyed my youth and stole my happiness. However, I found my voice in Kansas December 11th 1894 with inspiration from the Woman's Christian Temperance Union. Along with two other women, I went to the lo local drugstore and proclaimed, Mr. Day, the ladies of the WCTU want to see what you have in here. <laughs> there was a barrel of whiskey in plain sight right behind the prescription counter. 
well, just moments before, a police officer had helped roll it off the street. Well, the sale of alcohol was illegal in my state, but everyone was turning their backs on the lawbreakers. Of course, druggists were selling patent medicine, which was just alcohol in disguise. But really, a whole keg of whiskey in plain sight, not in a patent medicine jar mixed with other herbs? The nerve of these Saturn-faced, beak-nosed, donkey bedmates of Satan. Even though I was just over five feet tall, I turned that keg on its side and began rolling it toward the door, shouting to my fellow WCTUers, this is whiskey, come help. A policeman tried to stop me and it felt like he was breaking my neck. One of the other ladies came to my rescue and grabbed him by the collar and pinned him to the counter. The head of the local WCTU told the men, All right, you men, don't anyone touch these women. They are Christian women who are trying to save the boys of this state. Well, the men backed off as the keg was rolled onto the street, and I raised an axe, and I came down with it with all the force I could muster, and I broke that keg wide open with whiskey flowing into the street and gutters where it belonged. I knew God had sent me on a holy mission. I dropped to my knees and praised God. Then I set a torch to the whiskey. Carrie won that first skirmish in what would be a full-out war by her against saloons everywhere. The drugstore owner was refused a permit to sell liquor for medicinal purposes and had to move his family out of state. Meanwhile, a young man named Billy Sunday was beginning his career as a traveling evangelist, leading revivals in cities in the heartland of our country, after walking away from a very successful career in Major League Baseball. He too did battle with the sellers of alcohol, but with words. My early years were a time of family turmoil. I was born in a log cabin in Iowa during the darkest days of our nation's history. In 1862. My father was serving in the Union Army and wrote from the front lines telling my mother to name the baby William Ashley if it was a boy. He died a month after my birth of pneumonia. My mother quickly remarried as was the necessity of the time for a woman. She needed help supporting herself and her young children. My stepfather was a drunk and left the family after the birth of two more mouths to feed. Mother had a small pension from the government for her oldest boys and had a little assistance from her family. It was not enough to keep the wolf of poverty from howling and scratching at the cabin door. My mother decided to send my brother Ed and I to Soldier's Orphan Home in Glenwood, Iowa. I was 14 when I left the orphanage and returned to my maternal grandfather's farm with my brother. My grandfather, Martin Corey, was an industrious man who loved his family but was prone to periodic bouts of heavy drinking. I have never talked about it, but when my grandfather was drunk, he would mistreat me, and then when he was sober, he would feel bad about it. It was during one of those drinking bouts and mistreatments that I left his home, never to return to live on that farm. After the Civil War, three major temperance organizations were formed. There had been anti-alcohol sentiment before the war and even legislative and temperance activity, but the anti-slavery conflict drowned it out as the country went to war. The Prohibition Party was formed a few years after the Civil War and continues to nominate a candidate for President of the United States every four years. It was a political party which called for national uh, prohibition legislation and it was in combat with other major political parties of the time. The second group, the Woman's Christian Temperance Union, grew out of the Woman's Crusade in Hillsboro and Washington Courthouse, Ohio, which successfully closed the saloons and drugstores in those communities. It was an organization of women who also worked for suffrage, fair wages, clean water, and pure food. Finally, in 1893, a third group, 
which would be the most powerful, the Anti-Saloon League of America arose. It was a single issue organization. They believed that if you eliminated the saloon from society, disease, poverty, family dysfunction, and even government graft would go also. At the age of 17, my father told me that I was done with school. He needed me at home to help my mother with the ever-growing brood of youngsters. Oh, how sad I was to leave the schoolroom forever. I cried bitterly as I walked the 12 miles home. In 1865, my life changed when a Civil War veteran, Charles Gloyd, came to our farm looking for work as an educator. He had taught school while studying medicine and had served as a physician in the Civil War. He paid attention to me and I was enchanted by this older man who noticed me. My parents were horrified by the vis visible growing affection between us because they saw him as an abusing alcoholic and tried to put a distance between us. He was banished from our farm, but we smuggled letters back and forth. Charles moved to a nearby town and opened a medical practice to stop the objections of my parents about his lack of prospects and money. Our courtship continued in secret and I finally made myself so ill with the conflict between my beloved and his family. So on our engagement was finally announced, my mother did everything she could to end it. However, in November 1867, my wedding day came. Much to my sadness and embarrassment, Charles showed up tipsy to our wedding ceremony. Six months later, my marriage was over. Charles spent most nights at a, of our wedded life at the local lodge, stumbling into bed, reeking of alcohol. His medical practice failed because of his alcoholism. I was with child when I had to reach out to my parents and ask them if I could move home. They told me I could, and after the birth of my daughter Charlene, swore to me that if I listened to his pleas and returned to his home, they would never receive me into the family again. Well, I took those threats very seriously and recognizing his serious drinking problem, I simply collected my belongings from his home and turned my back on his entreaties to come back to him. Six months later, he was dead and I have regretted for the rest of my life that I did not return to him and try to wrestle him from the demons of alcohol. Our ill-fated union only lasted 16 months, but the scars of it lived on in the poor health of our daughter, which I am certain were in part caused by his drinking. I do believe that God took Charles, my first and greatest love, away from me to awaken me to the wickedness of alcohol so that I can raise up an army to defeat the foe. You ask me how I came to be known as Carrie A. Nation. Well, after my first disastrous marriage, a lawyer named David Nation handled Charles's estate. We courted for seven weeks, his wife having died only five weeks before we began stepping out. My family was not happy. You see, I was 28 and he was 47, a widower with five children, some of whom opposed our match. He promised me a good living with an eight-room house with two large cellars. David was battling the gossip of his wife's sudden death and our hasty wedding, 
and some bad business decisions, so decided to move us to Texas. This was the beginning of many moves and the end of our wedded happiness. David would go off and lead me to run first his farm and then a boarding house to support the family. He blamed me if I helped others, saying that I was using his money. But I felt it was God's will to help the poor and homeless. I always liked my religion, just like my oysters and beefsteak, piping hot. I got angry when the, my church refused to believe the word of a poor woman who was deserted by her alcoholic husband to raise his children and take in wash to support them. The church accused that poor woman of being unfaithful when it was her husband who was the guilty party. I guess this is when my activism on behalf of women everywhere and particularly those affected by drink began. I arose from my pew to come to that woman's defense and when she was denounced before the sermon on a Sunday. The elders were called forward to try and drag me from the church, but I clung to my seat and they finally gave up. <laughs> Bob a nickname, Pussyfoot Johnson. I answer that title also. It was when I left home to go to the University of Nebraska that I truly embraced the temperance cause, defined the rest of my life. On May 21st birthday, I was nominated for cemetery trustee on the Prohibition Party ticket. I began writing for the Prohibition Party publication, The Voice. Meanwhile, the Prohibition Party was hitting the toboggan slide. The plan for creating an impeccable political party was crumbling around our ears. The Anti-Saloon League was poking its head above the horizon, and as it grew, the Prohibition Party shrank. I've been fighting those rum-swilling saloon owners every which way I could. I once was asked by a reporter how I fought the saloon owners and said I had done everything I could for the cause. I lied, I bribed, and yes, I even drank for the cause. Some of the more sanctimonious among my dry colleagues were not happy with some of my methods. Some of these methods were learned when I was appointed a special agent to suppress liquor in the Indian territories in Oklahoma by none other than the great rough rider, Teddy Roosevelt. I was a marked man because of my success at stopping those rum runners. A $3,000 reward was offered for my death. Oh, all these developments convinced me that for the good of my health, I'd better tread softly in my operations. So I adopted a policy of night raiding for them some time after. I struck when I was least expected. The territory newspapers applied a new nickname to me. A nickname I have worn to this day, Pussyfoot. Honoring my cat-like stealth, pouncing on my enemies. After I left the hard scrabble life of my grandfather, I began to work and in my spare time play on a small town baseball team. My baseball skills caught the notice of the Chicago White Stockings. I received a telegram, my first, 
asking me to come to the Windy City for a chance to play at the big times. One Sunday afternoon, I was walking down State Street in Chicago with some of my favorite fellow players. We went into a saloon and drank. When we left, we came to a corner where some men and women were in a gospel wagon playing instruments and singing hymns that I heard my mother sing in the log cabin out in Iowa. We all sat on the curbstone and listened. It touched my heart in a way that began to heal some of the pain that I had been carrying around. I began attending the Jefferson Park Presbyterian Church near where most of us white stockings rented rooms. One evening in 1886, shortly after my religious experience, I met Helen Thompson, or Nell as I like to call her. She came from a well-to-do family, unlike me, and was 18 years old. I was smitten by her beauty and charm, but her family was not happy. I knew I was inferior to these folks but my future mother-in-law saw to the core of me and liked what she saw. Nell and I were married on September 5th, 1888. My baseball career, it was going along fine. I had a reputation as a clean young man among the hard-living professional baseball men. But I decided, along with my Nell, that I needed to make a change. So I gave up baseball in 1891 and joined the staff of the YWCA in Chicago. Then I got hired by the great J. Wilbur Chapman, a well-known revivalist as his advanced man and assistant. He left me stranded and disappointed in his integrity at Christmas in 1895, when he wired me that he was quitting the circuit and taking a pastorate. I was out of a job very suddenly, but God moved in mysterious ways, and I was asked to take Chapman's place and hold a revival. The first revival was in Garner, Iowa. It was a minor success because it led to more small town revivals. Those early years were rough. Nell was left home taking care of our young children. I had to travel constantly, set up a tent in all weather extremes, and got very meager plate offerings. But then the decision was made to have Nell join me as my business manager. Once Nell joined me on the Tenth Circuit, my audiences grew and the operation of my ministry was organized in a way that allowed for staff to be hired to handle the growing crowds. By 1910, I became the darling of the newspapers when I appeared in small towns like Youngstown and South Bend. I like to compare my smashing of saloons to the biblical smashing of idols. It all started when I took on my mortal enemies in Kiowa, Kansas in 1900. I traveled to the community with three brickbats, but I found some other tools upon the premises of the six establishments that got my treatment such as billiard balls and cue sticks. I flung my weapons at mirrors, bar tops, bottles, and windows, occasionally barely missing one of those slack-jawed saloon keepers who was afraid to look, but also afraid to leave. The law officers held me on the street for a time, but knowing their own guilt in those enterprises, let me go. The telegraph spread the news of my actions far and wide. I returned home to try to persuade my fellow WCTUers to take measures into their own hands. But my methods were frowned on by many of those women. My life's mission brought me many enemies and much scorn. Even the great Thomas Elva Edison used film to mock me by creating a production titled, Why Mr. Nation Wants a Divorce. He contended that I had neglected my natural role as wife and mother to go into the public sphere as a reformer and leaving my poor husband to act as a homemaker, which his gender makes him unequipped to handle? <laughs> I'll tell you who's flaunting natural law, and that's the business owners, government officials, and judges who sell illegal booze. My weapon of choice was a small hatchet, 
I hope I have inspired others to pick up their hatchets and chase out the liquor sellers. Carrie used money from speaking engagements to purchase property to use as a rescue home for wives of alcoholics. She sold little hatchet pins and other memorabilia related to her campaign theme. Her last hatchetation was in 1909 at the opening of Union Station in Washington, D.C., where she broke bottles of alcohol being sold there. She collapsed during a speech in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, proclaiming, I have done what I could. She died on June 9, 1911. Within five years, I was preaching in Philadelphia, Kansas City, Detroit, Boston, and Buffalo, and finally the big rallies in New York City. My sermons were printed in the paper. Of course, the printed words did not compare to seeing my sermons in person. I'd slide across the stage, leap up on the podium as I got into the heat of the moment. I was an out and out uncompromising foe of the liquor interests in our country. I saw that nine tenths of the misery, poverty, wrecked homes, and blighted lives were caused by booze. I saw it rob men of their manhood and clothe them in rags, take away their health, rob their families, incite the father to butcher his wife and child, rip the shirt off the back of a shivering man, take the last drop of milk from the breast of a nursing mother, and send women to steaming over wash tub to get money to feed a hungry brood, while they sent their father home from their hell holes, a bleary-eyed, bloated-faced, staggering, reeling, jabbering wreck. <clears throat> while all hell screamed with delight and heavens wept and angels hid behind their harps, I drew my sword and have never sheathed it since. Before his death, Sunday estimated that he had preached nearly 20,000 sermons, an average of 42 per month from 1896 to 1935. He was the Billy Graham of his era. Some credit his strong words with being one of the reasons for the passage of the 18th Amendment. One day in 1912, I found myself seated in a railway car across the table from Ernest Hurst Charrington, general manager of the American Issue Publishing Company, which put out a multitude of publications for the Anti-Saloon League in Westerville. He asked me to come to Westerville and assume the duties of managing editor for the 35 publications which belched from the League's battery of printing presses. The League wanted to spread its wings and be an influential across the world. I became its ambassador to the world. I traveled far and wide, spreading the message about the evils of alcohol across oceans and around the world. Something happened to me in London in November 1919 that forever changed my life and my story. I was to give a speech in London, but I was weak from a bout of the influenza when I arrived in the lecture hall and had to wade through a crowd of students protesting my visit. Well, they eventually broke through the lines of the police who had been called to bring order to the scene. I began to realize as they stormed the lecture hall and knocked me off my feet that it just was a student prank, not a serious assault, and I stopped struggling. They then placed me on a stretcher and made their way, carrying me through London traffic. This lasted for two hours, and when I was finally rescued, something came whizzing through the eye and hit me full in my right. I had an operation to save something from this optic wreckage, but it was, alas, not a go. And after several days, my eye was removed. I knew I had to be forgiven of those young boys because this was just a prank gone awry. I was offered compensation, but suggested they'd rather give it to me. It should be sent to the Fund for the Blind War Veterans. I think my eye was a martyr for the Tri Cause because suddenly I was the most popular man in England. With parties thrown for me by the rich, and even one banner proclaiming, Pussy's Foot's Eye will make England dry. Upon my return to Westerville, I was greeted as a hero and barnstormed all over America, finding that I looked even better through one porthole than I'd ever had through two. In his book, 
Prohibition, W.J. Rohrbaugh states, to defeat anti-Saloon League-backed dry candidates, wet opponents took money from brewers who made hidden donations through the German-American Alliance, an immigrant organization with two million members. When World War I began in 1914, the Alliance backed Germany. And by 1916, no candidate would be seen taking money either from the Brewers or from the Alliance. Once the U.S. declared war on Germany in April 1917, Congress imposed temporary wartime prohibition to prevent food shortages and pass the 18th Amendment. The amendment was ratified on January 16, 1919 and took effect January 17, 1920. liquor would be a beautiful thing. My two precious boys could grow up in a drier, safer, and generally better country without the specter of alcohol and the byproducts of alcoholism hanging over them. But very quickly after prohibition took effect, I was disillusioned by what was taking place. Young people everywhere were hanging out in speakeasies, and young women who would not have been caught dead in the old saloons were accompanying young men to these disreputable establishments. Pauline Morton Saban led a charmed life, daughter of Teddy Roosevelt, Secretary of the Navy, heiress to the Morton Salt Fortune, wife of a J.P. Morgan partner, and the first woman member of the Republican National Committee. She was the picture of the establishment. She lived in a 28-room home, Bayberry Land, on 290 acres in Southampton, New York, and had another home, the Oaks, a plantation on over 1,900 acres in South Carolina. She supported Prohibition from the beginning, but would become one of its most important critics. Despite her agreement with the passage of the 18th Amendment during Prohibition, she had a hidden wine cellar, and in the elite social circle she ran in, cocktails were a nightly habit before dinner. Let me introduce myself. I was the king of the bootleggers, George Remus. After the passage of the Volstead Act, which defined the terms of Prohibition, my law practice picked up considerably. I thought the law was unreasonable and nearly impossible to enforce. These men I was defending who had broken the law were paying my retainers in cash and did not seem bothered at all by the legal entanglements because they were making astonishing profits from their petty hip pocket bootlegging. I scoured the Volstead Act trying to find a loophole which would make this rum running a semi-legal activity. And I found it. Title II, Section 6. With a physician's prescription, it was legal to buy and use liquor for medicinal purposes. This provision was the greatest comedy. It was the greatest perversion of justice that I have ever known of in any civilized country in the world. Now, what you need to know is something about my background. I came to the country from Germany 
at the age of six in 1883. My father Frank, or Franz, he was already here. He liked his beer, and he came home drunk night after night. He was a mean and abusive alcoholic. Because of that, I never touched a drop of alcohol. I quit the eighth grade and went to work because he could no longer work. I earned five dollars a week at my uncle's pharmacy. At age 19, I bought the pharmacy. It was at that point I realized that I could sell anything to anyone under any circumstance. Remus's success in the pharmacy career led him to switch to the more lucrative law as a career. A dramatic defender of his clients, he sobbed and howled while making his case to the jury. In one case, he actually drank poison that his client had been accused of using to poison his wife. In a dramatic act, Remus took the bottle and drank the contents in front of the jury. Not displaying any effects, George's client was acquitted. The former pharmacist had taken an elixir to neutralize the poison before he ingested it. This tells us a lot about George Remus, when at any cost. According to the new book, The Ghost of Eden Park, when George entered liquor trafficking, he was 44 years old and was the embodiment of the new decade, a harbinger of its grandest excesses and its darkest illusions. He endeavored to become the best in the country at his chosen profession, a profession that could not have flourished so dramatically in any other era, nor become so swiftly obsolete. I was married at a young age to an older woman and had a daughter. Then Imogen came into my life. She was getting a divorce and cleaning law offices when I first met her. We shared the misery of our failing marriages and she asked me to represent her. I fell in love with her and I shared everything with her, including all of my secrets, my family drama and the fact that I was uh, not, in fact, a citizen. I began to pay the rent on her apartment and to give her an allowance. I was determined to protect her and her young daughter, Ruth, from everything that I had gone through. So I left my own family and started down a new path. I closed my Chicago law practice and moved to Cincinnati because 80% of the country's pre-prohibition bonded whiskey was stored within 300 miles of that southern Ohio town. I bought distilleries to gain possession of their whiskey that was locked up when the prohibition took effect. I acquired wholesale drug companies so that I could use that Volstead Act loophole to sell a lot of medicinal liquor that I would withdraw from the stocks that I had acquired. I organized a transport company to arrange for widespread distribution of my alcohol, and I paid employees to hijack those trucks on their way to deliver medicinal alcohol, and then could sell it on the bootleg trail for any price I wanted. <laughs> I nicknamed my business The Circle. It was Remus, robbing Remus to pay Remus. Genius, right? <laughs> Within a year of using this system, I owned 35% of the existing stock of warehouses liquor in the country. I had 30,000 people in my employ, and I was an important part of the business community of Southern Ohio. At Imogen's behest, we were married in Newport, Kentucky, and I bought a fancy Price Hill mansion. It cost me $75,000. That was a record residential sale for Cincinnati. <laughs> but what did I care? I was making money hand over fist, and I had the woman of my dreams by my side. To prove my devotion and trust, I put the mansion in her name. Yes, in her name alone. One of the major complaints about prohibition was the graft and corruption that took root along with the passage of the 18th Amendment. In the fall of 1920, federal agent William Mellon was sent to Ohio to begin to assess what was going on in Cincinnati. 
he managed to wiretap the phone of the Remus family and took notes on visitors to the Remus suite. In one day, 44 people visited the suite, many of them local prohibition agents or deputy marshals who were collecting bribes from Remus. Mellon contacted a federal agent in Cincinnati who gave him the brush off. But someone came along who would not ignore Remus's illegal activities, Mabel Willebrand, Assistant United States Attorney General. She sent Special Agent Franklin Dodge Jr. to Cincinnati to find a way to entrap Remus. In 1921, it all began to unravel. In the spring of 1921, after Harding became president, I was contacted by someone in the Justice Department and told that uh, for a price, I could obtain an unlimited number of genuine government liquor withdrawal permits. Up to this point, I had been using bribery and forgery to get permits. Now, I could do it legally. I met with a man named Jess Smith, who was doing some kind of work in the Justice Department and was part of the Harding, Ohio gang. Smith promised me protection from prosecution for $50,000. I handed him 50 $1,000 bills and felt safe. <laughs> he was connected, if you know what I mean. By this time, my business stretched across nine states from New York to Kansas. No one could estimate my worth. <laughs> I didn't put anything down on paper because I had a photographic memory. In a time when the average salary was just $1,400 per year, I was averaging $50,000 a day in deposits. <laughs> I probably had a yearly gross of $80 million. I couldn't even get the cash into the bank fast enough. I carried $100,000 in my pocket at all times. <sighs> because of the feds and their scrutiny, my major operation was curtailed when my colleagues were arrested. I was also charged and bail was set at $50,000 for me. I was not worried because I knew that I had friends in high places and I would get off. Meanwhile, my business was better than ever as prices rose on the fear that I would actually be shut down. <laughs> oh. To celebrate our move into the mansion on Price Hill, we threw a New Year's Eve bash that was to really show everyone that I had made it. We had six maids addressing invitations which stated our New Year's greeting. Dive to health, swim to wealth, float on happiness, 1921-1922. One hundred guests came from all over the country, dressed in silk and dripping with the jewels. An orchestra played, all the best alcohol was served. I was in my element lighting guests' cigars with $100 bills. When dinner was served, guests found $1,000 bills under their plates. That was not all. A jewelry box was given to each male guest, and it was a stick pin topped with a knob of diamonds and a gold watch engraved with the letter R. The women in attendance were a little disappointed that they did not have a jewelry box. But just when they were appearing to be a little let down, I brought out a set of keys and led my guests to the front door. As far as you could see, there were brand new 1922 Pontiac automobiles. One for each of my lady guests. <laughs> With my largesse, the party hit a high note right before I unveiled my pool house. I dreamed of having a pool since I was a little boy, and now I had one of the finest pools in the country in my house. Ah, the band played I'm the Sheik of Araby, while swimmers performed acrobatically synchronized dance routines. My dear daughter Ruth dived into the pool shouting, Happy New Year! And then, my Imogen wowed the crowd in a one-piece bathing suit. Mwah! Ah, and she dove into the pool gracefully. Ah, 
The band, upon my urging, jumped in wearing their tuxedos. <laughs> I joined them! <laughs> what a night! <laughs> trailing his every move. With Imogene at his side, Remus went to court. Half the charges for failing to pay income tax were dismissed. Remus, much to his amazement, was found guilty of the remaining charges and sentenced to two years in the penitentiary in Atlanta and fined $10,000. Remus met again with Jeff Smith in D.C. and was told it would cost another $130,000 to make this all disappear in the appeals process. Other indignities were to follow. He was disbarred in the state of Illinois. Imogene began to be defiant in the face of the chinks in his armor. Jeff Smith, his protector, had begun to lose favor with President Harding who was involved with another scandal that was brewing. Harding had gotten wind of some of Smith's activities and did not want any more scandal. Smith, who also had health and personal problems, took his own life. Remus did not despair. He would reach out to Harding himself. However, George's appeal was denied June 30, 1923 and Harding died August 1923. I made arrangements for the business to carry on while I was in jail. Imogen and I had no secrets between us, and she was sure we could go away after the jail sentence and forget the disgrace. My attorney prepared a power of attorney to put everything in Imogen's name. Imogen closed the mansion and moved to Atlanta to be near me. I knew she was the most trustworthy of my associates. Oh, thank God for Imogen. She brought flower arrangements for my dinner table, cake, and specially prepared meals for me in my prison cell. She would even clean the cell herself. I asked her to reach out to Agent Dodge to uh, <laughs> sweet talk him and try to get me released early. This was a huge mistake. By the time I was released from prison on September 2nd, 1925, Imogen was no longer living in Atlanta, but was just sending me long letters. I found out that she had started an affair with that cheat and liar special agent Franklin Dodge. And they were living on my money! Imogen had the nerve to file for divorce and to begin to liquidate all of my assets. I went back to Ohio because I still had a year of sentence to complete there, and I wanted to track Franklin down. He had lost his job at that point. <sighs> I was going to find him and my cheating spouse. <sighs> On the day of our divorce trial, I saw Imogen coming out of her hotel with Ruth. Dodge was not with her. I was very disappointed. 
Imogen was smiling and laughing, obviously enjoying what the day was going to bring, the end to our marriage. A switch was turned in my head. I told my driver to follow her. I shot her in Eden Park. That was the last time I saw her alive. I turned myself into the police. They told me she had died at the hospital. Imogen was 38 years old. She who dances down the primrose path must die on the primrose path. I'm happy. This is the first peace I have had in two and a half years. Now, my fate must be in the hands of 12 men, and I will abide by their decision. The jury deliberated 19 minutes and took one ballot. Their verdict was not guilty on the grounds of insanity. George was placed in an insane asylum for a short period of time, but was ordered release by the Ohio Supreme Court. Newspaper articles printed after his release stated, his career was short, but not even the prison term which terminated it can extinguish its brilliance and audacity. In the years 1920 and 1921, Remus was to bootlegging what John D. Rockefeller had been to the oil industry. He tried to recover the assets that Ruth had stolen, but was never successful. In 1952, he died in Covington, Kentucky. The headline read, Fabulous George Remus Dies, Made Millions as Bootleg King. As crime rose and lawbreaking became an epidemic, I became a more and more vocal opponent of the prohibition laws as they were written. They were not enforceable. The young see the law broken at home and upon the street. Can we expect them to be lawful? Today in any speakeasy in the U U.S., you can find boys and girls in their teens drinking liquor. And this situation has become so acute that the mothers of this country feel something must be done to protect their children. I supported Hoover for president in 1928, sure that he agreed with my stand on the alcohol issue and could not possibly be a true blue dry. But on March 4th, 1929, when he stood at the steps of the Capitol at his inauguration and declared that disregard and disobedience to the law was the biggest threat facing America, I knew that I had been betrayed. This was the line that the Anti-Saloon League preached. He did not seem to see any flaws in the law. The next day, I resigned from the Republican National Committee and gathered together a group of 11 socially prominent women. My group, the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform, included a Roosevelt, DuPont, and Harriman. I traveled to 31 states in 12 months, and the luster of my organization shined brighter. The Prohibition Party did not fail to notice my activities and had some choice words, saying that we were all maidens parching for wine who would not take the pennies off the eyes of the dead for the sake of legalizing booze. They said we were the scum of the earth, parading around in skirts and possibly late at night flirting with other women's husbands at drunken and fashionable resorts. We must have scared them for such rhetoric as this to be thrown at us. We were like a handful of men standing at the foot of Niagara Falls with a sponge, wondering how to stop the flow. Industrial leaders who had fought with us and legislators who had always deferred to dry wishes sensed the drift of sentiment and dropped away from us in droves. Contributions vanished as the depression deepened. The once bulging treasuries became more and more slender until only cobwebs remained and their yawning emptiness. We fought an utterly hopeless fight. People were no longer with us. By the mid-1920s, as crime syndicates ruled the flow of alcohol, the Anti-Saloon League was going through a time of turmoil. Reverend Pearlie Baker, the second superintendent of the league, and Wayne Wheeler, nicknamed the dry boss of Congress, both passed away. 
Funding began to disappear as major donors like John D. Rockefeller began to see the unintended consequences of the 18th Amendment. The Great Depression put the final nail in the coffin of prohibition. Suddenly, millions were out of work, the coffers of the U.S. Treasury were in need of cash, and the anti-dry forces had found their voice in organizations like Pauline's. The 24th Amendment was ratified December 5, 1933. It was the only constitutional amendment to repeal another. The beginning of the end came earlier in 1933 after the inauguration of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. When the Cullen Harrison Act was passed that March, this allowed 3 2 beer to be sold. Even here in Westerville, the dry capital of the world, a pool hall began to sell beer against the protest of the Reverend Howard Hyde Russell, the founder of the Anti Saloon League. But this did not last long because through local option, the Westerville community voted itself dry again. This lasted until in January 2006, the first beer was sold in uptown Westerville, ushering in a new era. <music> Luna, the name 